So we're starting uh, this afternoon with our second U.S. Poets Laureate. In case you haven't noticed, there's a theme emerging in this, uh, this reading sequence. Uh, besides being uh, the Poet Laureate for two terms, Rita Dove is the only poet to win both the National Medal of the Arts from President Obama in 2011 and the National Medal for the Humanities from President Clinton in 1996. And I think that that pairing of arts and humanities says something about her work and her life's work, uh, that she's, besides being an accomplished poet, there is a connection in all of her work to the history of her time um, and the history of her country. And, you know, works like Thomas and Beulah on the bus with Rosa Parks inspired a whole generation of poets to write historically themed poetic sequences. There have been dozens of these books since, um, since the publications of those two books. This has been a wave of, of one poet's influence that I think has changed the shape of, of what many young women especially, many young women of color are doing as, as young poets. Um, and it's not often you can that immediately powerfully connect the impact of one poet on a, on a whole generation of other poets. Read it up. Good afternoon. Ah, uh, Dodge. Dodge is a, you know, to use that old cliche, it's a labor of love, I'd say it's a feast of love, it's a dance of love. It's a miracle of love. And thank you for being here and being part of all of that love. I would um, also like to thank those marvelous young musicians once again. Wells Fargo, they're keeping it alive. And it, it, my heart almost cracks open with gratitude when I saw them up here. And, and because of that, I, I of course changed my reading. They told us to be prepared and I changed it. Because I wanted to read this poem. There was a time when many jazz musicians really had to survive. In order to survive, they, they had to go abroad and uh, did most of their bread and butter work overseas. When I was in Germany once in the in the eighties I had an opportunity to hear champion Jack Dupree, who was living in Europe at the time, um, because they, you know, recognized how important he was. And this poem is for him. It's about him, but it's also just with relief that, that jazz has come home again. Shakespeare say, he had a, a running thing. He would always say Shakespeare say instead of Confucius say, <laughs> which appealed to me. <laughs> Shakespeare say, he drums the piano wood crowing. Champion Jack in love and in debt in a tan walking suit with a flag on the pocket, with a red eye for women, with a diamond studded ear, with sand and a mouthful of mush. Poor me, poor me, I keep on drifting like a ship out on the sea. That afternoon, two students from the Academie showed him the town. Munich was misbehaving, whipping his ass to ice while his shoes soaked through. His guides pointed at a clock in a blue tiled house. And tonight, every song he sings is written by Shakespeare and his mother-in-law. I love you, baby, but it don't mean a goddamn thing. In trouble with every woman he's ever known, all of them ugly, skinny legs, lie gap waiting behind the lips to suck him in. Going down slow, crooning, Shakespeare say, man must be careful what he kiss when he drunk. 
Going down for the third set past the stragglers at the bar, the bourbon in his hand, some bitch's cold, wet heart, the whole joint stinking on beer, in love and winning now, so even the mistakes sound like jazz. Poor me, moaning so no one hears. My home's in Louisiana, my voice is wrong. I'm broke and can't hold my piss. My mother told me there'd be days like this. Hattie McDaniel. Yes. If you don't know, was um, the first African American to get a, an Oscar for a supporting role in a movie. The movie was Gone with the Wind. The supporting role was that of a maid. And in 1940, when the Oscars were given out for the previous year's films, the award ceremonies took place in the Coconut Grove, and all of the recipients, or the potential recipients, had to kind of get out of their car and about a block away and walk a gauntlet. It wasn't quite the red carpet. Hattie McDaniel arrives at the Coconut Grove late in aqua and ermine, gardenia scaling her left sleeve in a spasm of scent, her gloves white, her smile chastened, purse giddy with stars and rhinestones clipped to her brilliantined hair. On her free arm, that fine Negro, Mr. Wonderful Smith. It's the day that isn't, February 29th, at the end of the shortest month of the year. And the shittiest, too, everywhere except Hollywood, California, where the maid can wear mink and still be a maid, bobbing her bandaged head and, cur and cursing the white folks under her breath as she smiles and shoes their silly daughters in from the night dew. What can she be thinking of, striding into the ballroom where no black face has ever showed itself except above a serving tray? High hat Hattie, Mama Mac, her haughtiness, the little lady from Showboat whose name being forgot, Beulah and Bertha, Melina and Carrie and Violet and Cynthia and Fidelia, one half of the dark Barrymores. Dear Mammy, we can't help but hug you, crawl into your generous lap, tease you with arch innuendo so we can feel that much more wicked and youthful and sleek. But oh, what we forgot. The four husbands, the phantom pregnancy, your famous parties, your celebrated icebox cake. Your giggle above the red petticoats rustle, black girl and white girl walking hand in hand down the railroad tracks in Kansas City, six years old. The man who advised you, now that you were famous, to begin eliminating your more common acquaintances and your reply, catching him square in the eye. That's a good idea. I'll start right now by eliminating you. <laughs> is she or isn't she? Three million dishes, a truckload of aprons and head rags later, and here you are, poised between husbands and factions. No corset wide enough to hold you in, your huge face a dark moon split by that spontaneous smile. Your trademark, your curse. No matter, Hattie. It's a long, beautiful walk into that flower-smothered standing ovation. So go on and make them wait. Yeah. Uh, Alberto was talking about potato chips. <laughs> said he hadn't even seen one in years. And uh, 
it's true. Every every <laughs> few months, something else becomes forbidden. Uh, chocolate is supposed to be good for you. In you know moderation. That's the word. Uh, it's a shame that moderation has become the rule of the day. So here's my love song to chocolate. Velvet fruit, exquisite square I hold up to sniff between finger and thumb. How you numb me with your rich attentions. If I don't eat you quickly, you'll melt in my palm. Pleasure seeker, if I let you, you'd liquefy everywhere. Knotted smoke, dark punch of earth and night and leaf. For a taste of you, any woman would gladly crumble to ruin. Enough chatter. I am ready to fall in love. <laughs> In an effort to stay the inevitable, my husband and I took up ballroom dancing about 15 years ago and uh, met an entire universe of people that we didn't know uh, before from all ages and races and classes and the main thing was, can you dance? That was it. There was another uh, person who was always on the sidelines of all of the dances and the competitions and showcases that we would go to, and that was the dress lady, who had those fantastical outfits. Either they had enough, you know, enough material for a country, or they had enough material for, well, a snapshot, perhaps. <laughs> Brown. Why, you look good, in every color, the dress lady gurgled just before I stepped onto the parquet for a waltz. I demurred. We were in a country club, after all, and she, fresh from Fort Lauderdale, do people actually live there? With five duffel bags worth of ball gowns, enough tulle and fringe and pearls to float a small cotillion, was only trying to earn a living. For once, I was not the only black person in the room. Two others, both male. I thought of Sambo. I thought a few other things, too, unmentionable here. Don't get me wrong. I've always loved my skin, the way it glows against citron and fuchsia, the difficult hues. But the difference I cause whenever I walk into a polite space is why I prefer grand entrances, especially with a waltz, that European constipated swoon. <laughs> the dress in question was red. <laughs> Alberto Rios Tito had mentioned our times uh, back in our youth when we had two young children who played together. And I thought that I really wanted to read this poem in response to that because it's a poem that, that um, my daughter was growing up, uh, one of her favorite books was Mickey in the Night Kitchen. And when I wrote this poem, I, at first I read it because she was too young to read it. And then I stopped reading it for many years because I didn't want her to be embarrassed. And finally we hit upon an agreement that if she was within 30 miles of me, I could not read it. <laughs> uh, now she's 31 and she said a few years ago, she said, you know, you can just read that poem, it's okay. So, <laughs> after reading Mickey in the Night Kitchen for the third time before bed, with an epigraph, I'm in the milk and the milk's in me. I'm Mickey. My daughter spreads her legs to find her vagina. Hairless, 
This mistaken bit of nomenclature is what a stranger cannot touch without her yelling. She demands to see mine, and momentarily we're a lopsided star among the spilled toys, my prodigious scallops exposed to her neat cameo. And yet, the same glazed tunnel, layered sequences. She is three. That makes this innocent. We're pink, she shrieks and bounds off. Every month she wants to know where it hurts and what the wrinkled string means between my legs. This is good blood, I say, but that's wrong too. How to tell her that it's what makes us, black mother, cream child, that we're in the pink and the pink's in us. She's now a mother. Um, it's been a grandparent seven months old, and we're just as giddy as every grandparent has ever been since <laughs> time began. And I'm reminded when I look at the, uh, our new granddaughter just how ruthless children can be. Mm -hmm. The breathing, the endless news. Every god is lonely, an exile composed of parts, elk horn, cloven hoof. Receptacle for wishes, each god is empty without us, penitent, raking our yards into wind-blown piles. Children know this. They are the trailings of gods. Their eyes hold nothing at birth, then fill slowly with the myth of ourselves. Not so the dolls, out for the count, each toe pouting from the slumped over toddler clothes. No blossoming there. So we give our children dolls, and they know just what to do. Line them up and shoot them. <laughs> With every execution, doll and God grow stronger. Meditation at 50 yards, moving target. Safety first. Never point your weapon, keep your finger off the trigger. Assume a loaded barrel, even when it isn't, especially when you know it isn't. Glocks are lightweight but sensitive. The Caltech has a long pull and a kick. Rifles have penetrating power, that is, if the projectile doesn't lodge in its mark, it will travel some distance until it finds shelter. It will certainly pierce your ordinary drywall partition. You could wound the burglar and kill your child sleeping in the next room, all with one shot. Open air. Fear, of course. Then the sudden pleasure of heft, as if the hand had always yearned for this solemn fit, this gravitas, and now had found its true repose. Don't pull the trigger. Squeeze it. Squeeze between heartbeats. Look down the sights. Don't hold your breath. Don't hold anything. Just stop breathing. Level the scene with your eyes. Listen, soft now, squeeze. Gender politics. Guys like noise, rapid fire, thunk and slide of a blunt-nosed silver Mossberg or double-headed colt slugging it out from the hips. Rambo or cowboy, they'll whoop it up. Women are fewer, more elegant. They prefer precision, tin cans swing dancing in the trees, the paper bullseye's tidy rupture at 50 yards. Question, 
If you were being pursued, how would you prefer to go down? Ripped through a blanket of fire or plucked by one incandescent fingertip? Mm. The bullet. Dark, dark, no wind, no heaven. I am not anything, not born on air. I bear myself. I can slice the air. No wind can hold me. Let me, let me go. I can see, yes, O oh aperture, O oh light, let me off, go off. Straight is my verb, straight my glory road. Yes, now I can feel it, the light. I am flame, velocity. O oh beautiful body, I am coming, I am yours. Before you know it, I am home. Thank you. Um, a little solemn, that. I'd like to read a couple of poems, a few poems, um, I think four, from this book called Sonata Mulatica. It's a, a big book. It's a book about a life, a lost life, that of a mixed race, violent prodigy who lived during the time of Beethoven. And I'd like to read you a couple from his early life and then skip to the end of his life because the middle is the part that we knew a little bit about. And that is that when he was in his 20s, he went to Vienna, met Beethoven, and Beethoven composed a sonata in his honor. And then Beethoven got into an argument with him and destroyed the dedication, and he dropped right out of history. So there was this brief moment when this miraculous being, I think, someone whose father built himself as an African prince and whose mother was from somewhere in Central Europe, uh, had his moment of fame, but then disappeared again. So what, what stunned me was the fact that he, that he existed, and I wanted to know how he existed. How was his living? How was his life? And so I'll read you a couple of poems uh, from that early part. The first one is when he's 10 years old. It's the 1790s, which was Billy's one of his nostalgic moments in 1790s. This is a different 1790s. It is um, in London. And as a 10-year-old, he's 10 years old at this time, his father has taken him on the road and they are going, they are walking to their next concert, which was at one of the theaters. The, uh, because there are no iPads or any kind of recorded music at that time, you got all of your music live. And so music was woven through life in interesting ways. He's on his way to the concert, they're dressed up in outrageously kind of what people think Africans should wear if they were wearing, you know, these kind of clothes. They're dressed up in these outrageous clothes for effect and uh, they walk past another musician who is a street musician. He's also a violinist and he is also black and his name is Black Billy Waters and this is his song. Black Billy Waters at his pitch. All men are beggars, white or black. Some worship gold, some pedal brass. My only house is on my back. I play my fiddle, I stay on track. Give my peg leg, thank you sire, a jolly thwack. All men are beggars, white or black. And the plank of coin in my gunny sack is the bittersweet music in a life of lack. My only house is on my back. Was a soldier once, led a failed attack in that greener country for the Union Jack. All men are beggars, white or black. Crippled as a crab, sugary as sassafras. I'm Black Billy Waters, and you can kiss my sweet ass. <laughs> my only house weighs on my back. There he struts like a Turkish crackerjack. London cues for any novelty, and that's a fact. 
All men are beggars, white or black. And to this bright brown upstart, hack among kings, one piece of advice, don't unpack. All the home you'll own is on your back. I'll dance for the price of a mean cognac, sing gay songs like a natural born maniac. All men are beggars, white or black. So let's scrape the cat gut clean, stack the cords three deep. See, I'm no quack, though my only house is on my back. All men are beggars, white or black. This George Bridge Tower is the name of the boy, the violinist, the young violinist, grows up um, under the protection of the Prince of Wales, which should be a pretty good deal, you'd think. Except that the prince banishes his father. He sends him away. His father has been seducing women left and right, who seemed to be the, an earlier version of groupies. Uh, and he sends him away, and he says, I'll take care of the boy. So the first thing he does with this child is to say, we're going to get you out of those outlandish clothes and dress you properly. The undressing. First the sash, peacock blue. Silk unfurling round and round until I'm the India ink dotting a cold British eye. Now I can bend and peel off my shoes, try to hook the tasseled tips into the emerald sails of my satin pantaloons. Farewell, sir, monkey jacket, monkey red. Adieu, shirt, tart and bright as the lemons the prince once let me touch. Goodbye, lakeside meadow. Goodbye, hummingbird throat. No more games. I am to become a proper British gentleman, cuffed and buckled with breeches and a fine cravat. But how? My tossed bed glows while I, I am a smudge, a quenched wick, a twig shrouded in snow. does grow up, he does become a proper British gentleman, but then he hears that there is this madman composing incredible music way over in Vienna, and he wants to go there. And so he sets out for Vienna at the, in his early 20s. What he did not know as he was going toward Vienna was that Ludwig van Beethoven was going deaf and trying to figure out if he could hide it enough to continue garnering the favors of the people who were paying for his art. So uh, he was sent off, Ludwig van Beethoven was sent off to a, a little town, Heiligenstadt, for, to take the waters and to cure himself <coughs> of, of deafness. And this is his moment. Ludwig van Beethoven's return to Vienna. Three miles from my adopted city lies a village where I came to peace. The world there was a calm place. Even the great Danube, no more than a pale ribbon tossed onto the landscape by a girl's careless hand. Into this stillness I had been ordered to recover. The hills were gold with late summer. My rooms were two plus a small kitchen situated upstairs in the back of a cottage at the end of the Herengasse. From my window I could see onto the courtyard where a linden tree twined skyward, leafy umbilicus canted toward light, warped in the very act of yearning and I would feed on the sun as if that alone would dismantle the silence around me. At first, 
I raged. Then music raged in me, rising so swiftly I could not write quickly enough to ease the roiling. I would stop to light a lamp and whatever I'd missed, larks flying to nest, church bells, the shepherds home toward evening song, rushed in and I would rage again. I am by nature a conflagration. I would rather leap than sit and be looked at. So when my proud city spread her gypsy skirts, I re-entered, burning toward her greater constant light. Call me rough, ill-tempered, slovenly. I tell you every tenderness I have ever known has been nothing but thwarted violence, an ache so permanent and deep the lightest touch awakens it. It is impossible to care enough. I have returned with a second symphony and 15 piano variations which I've named Prometheus after the rogue Titan, the half a god who knew the worst sin is to take what cannot be given back. I smile and bow and the world is loud. And though I dare not lean in to shout, can't you see that I'm deaf? I also cannot stop listening. You know, in the craft lecture, we were talking about where one begins a poem or starts a poem or a book, and I think I almost never start at the beginning. And this book was no exception. I, I did not start it at the beginning. I started it with Beethoven because I figured you had to get rid of that, that you know, that person on the mantelpiece, you know. The, and if I could, um, dare to speak in his voice than I could dare to speak in anyone's. And why not? I'm going to, I'm not going to go through the, the whole meeting of them um, because that is perhaps an inducement for you to buy the book. <laughs> but I will, but I will say that after this moment of, of incredible luck and, and, the, and miraculous luck for George Bridgetower, he lives a very long life of a musician, but in relative obscurity. He dies at the age of 80 in the south of London in what we would call the projects today, in subsidized housing. Number eight, Victory Cottages, Peckham, 1860. Not true. What the limming, I'll begin that again. <laughs> Not true what the living claim we regret in the last hour. No memories worth blubbering through, nor scrabbling for favor in the eyes of our children, nor honor sought among friends. Drool travels unnoticed from collar to pillow, while, suspended by blankets, a thigh dangles, blameless and bare. Shame has lost its sting in this penultimate hell, these next to last days when we're still ourselves. I don't need wine or gossip or weather. I don't give a fig for warm socks or don't laugh the summer's last pear, a fruit I haven't been able to digest for 20 years and have mourned for as long. What's any of it compared to this draining of humors, this wondrous uncaring? Pain is an interference. Love is cumbersome. For I loved only what my fingers could do. And even they did not serve me forever. Thank you. I thought I'd end with a few uh, newer poems or uncollected poems. 
I, um, as I mentioned, my husband and I have been doing dancing way before Dancing with the Stars came out. And we have all of the um, accoutrements that come with that pain, like ace bandages and Epsom salts. You know, we have the whole battery of it. We've got it. Um, this poem I like to read because of my students. They uh, pushed me to do this. I give them a writing assignment every semester, an individualized writing uh, assignment that is so wild and impossible that they, they tremble to get it, but they can't wait to get it. At least I think they can't wait to get it. It's called a wild card, and they said, why don't you do one for yourself? And I said, okay, fair is fair. So I gave myself a, a wild card. In this um, poem, every line is alliterative. So that means that there are only words that begin with the letter O in the first line and only words that begin with the letter P in the second. And uh, so it goes. Ode to my right knee. I should say that my right knee, I talk to it at times. I say, why don't you do what the left one does? <laughs> Ode to my right knee. O oh, obstreperous one, ornery outside of ordinary protocols, paramilitary proby par excellence, every evidence you yield yells. No noise, too tough to tackle, tears springing such sudden salt when walking wrenches, haranger, hag, hanger on, how much more maddening, insidious imperfection. Membranes matter-of-factly corroding, crazed cartilage calmly chipping away as another arduous ambulation begins, bone bruising bone. Leathery Lothario, lone laboring gladiator, grappling, groveling for favor. Fair weather forecaster, Fickle friend, jive jiggy joint, kindly keep kicking. <laughs> Billy, Billy Collins is a morning guy because there's a lot of Cheerios and food, you know, a lot of orange juice and, and stuff. And, and uh, I'm the polar opposite. I'm so nocturnal, you won't believe. Insomnia etiquette. There's a movie on, so I watch it. The usual white people in love, distress. The usual tears. Good camera work, though. Sunshine waxing the freckled curves of a pear, a clenched jaw. More tragedy, then. I get up for some scotch and Stilton. I don't turn on the lights. I like moving through the dark while the world sleeps on, serene as a stealth bomber nosing through clouds. Call it a peremptive strike, a precautionary measure so sadly necessary in these perilous times. I don't call it anything but greediness, the weird glee of finding my way without incident. I know tomorrow I will regret having the Stilton. <laughs> I will regret not being able to find a book to get lost in. In all those years, I could get lost in anything. Until then, it's just me and you, Brother Knight, moonless, plunked down behind enemy lines with no maps, no matches, the woods deep. Cheers. <laughs> Prose poem. <coughs> prose in a small space. It's supposed to be prose if it runs on and on, isn't it? 
All those words, too many to fall into rank and file, stumbling <laughs> bare ass drunk onto the field, reporting for duty, yes sir, spilling out as shamelessly as the glut from a mega billion dollar <laughs> chemical facility, just the amount of glittering effluvium it takes to transport a little girl across a room. Beige carpet thick under her oxfords, curtains blousy with spring. Is that the scent of daffodils drifting in? Daffodils don't smell, but prose doesn't care. Prose likes to hear itself talk. Prose is development and denouement, anticipation hovering near the canopies, lust rampant in the antipasta. For example, a silver fork fingered sadly as the heroine crumples a linen napkin in her lap to keep from crying out at the sight of Lord Campion's regal brow inclined tenderly toward the wealthy young widow. Prose applauds such syntactical dalliances. <laughs> then, is it poetry if it's confined? Trembling along its axis, a flagpole come alive in high wind, flapping its radiant sleeve for attention. Over here, it's me, while the white spaces, air, field, early morning silence before the school bell, shape themselves around that one bright seizure. And if that's so, what do we have here? A dream or three paragraphs? We have white space too. Is this music? As for all the words left out, banging at the gates, we could let them in, but where would we go with our orders, our stuttering pride? Thank you. I'm going to end with these three short poems that um, came out of something that my daughter used to say when she was very young. We thought we gave her a happy childhood, but she would walk around the house singing, Nobody Loves Me But the Spring Cricket. And when questioned, she would shake her head and walk away. So, these are for her, and um, I, I've read one of them here before, but you need to hear the companion one perhaps too. The spring cricket considers the question of negritude. I was playing my tunes all by myself. I didn't know anybody else who could play along. Sure, the tunes were sad, but sweet too, and wouldn't come until the day gave up. You know that way the sky has of dangling her last bright wisps? That's when the egg would bloom inside until I couldn't wait. I knelt down to scrape myself clean and didn't care who heard. Then came the shouts and whistles, the roundup into jars, a clamber of legs. Now there were others, tumbled, clouded. I didn't know their names. We were a musical lantern. Children slept to our rasping sighs. And if now and then one of us shook free and sang as he climbed to the brim, he would always fall again, which made them laugh and clap their hands. At least then we knew what pleased them and where the brink was. The spring cricket repudiates his parable of negritude. <laughs> Hell, we just climbed. Reached the lip and fell back, slipped and started up again. Climbed to be climbing, sang to be singing. It's just what we do. No one bothered to analyze our blues until everybody involved was strung out or dead to solve everything that was happening while it was happening would have taken some serious opium. Seriously, 
All wisdom is afterthought, a sort of helpless relief. So don't go thinking none of this grief belongs to you. Even if you don't know how it feels to fall, you can get my drift. And I, who live it daily, have heard that perfect word enough to know just when to use it, as in, oh hell, hell no, no, this is hell. And I'll end with this one, I want to thank all of you the, for being here, for making this happen, for loving poetry. Little Outburst. Tired of singing for someone else. Tired of rubbing my thighs to catch your ear. When the sky falls tonight, I'll stand on my one green leaf. And it will be my time, my noise, my ecstasy.